Hi everyone, welcome to this recording of the chapter one lecture for Introduction to Nutrition. Um, if you have any issues with the video quality or hearing things, as always, just send me an email and I'll try to address it. Um, but hopefully everything's recording <laughs> correctly and you can see both the PowerPoint presentation and a little thumbnail maybe of my video. Um, alrighty, so let's go through chapter one. I'm going to divide into two parts, or there are going to be two lectures for chapter one because there are quite a quite a number of slides for us to get to. So, with chapter one, we basically just introduce what nutrition is. So we'll spend a few slides um, learning what we mean when we say nutrition and. Um, chapter one will also kind of be um, a course preview. So chapter one will introduce a lot of the concepts that will, at, at very base level, that we'll talk about in greater detail throughout the next uh, five months. So nutrition, first and foremost, um, we can give it kind of two definitions. We can say nutrition is the foods that we eat. And as human beings, we eat a collection of different plants and different animals. Ultimately, that's what our food is, and we get nutrition from the foods that we eat. Nutrition is also a science. Nutrition is the science that studies the food that we eat. So nutrition studies plants and animals as you know, a source of food to human beings, to human animals. Um, in this science, we look at how food nourishes our bodies, so how food provides health to our bodies. Um, part of that science looks at how we eat, so there's a lot of psychology associated with nutrition, um, how we digest, metabolize, and store nutrients. So digestion, metabolism, and nutrient absorption and storage that dips into quite a bit of biology, chemistry, and biochemistry. So nutrition really is a, a hard science. It kind of mixes what are sometimes referred to as the soft sciences like psychology and sociology, as well as the hard sciences of biology, chemistry, biochemistry, and even physics. Um, so nutrition will also look at eating patterns. So again, some of the like psychology, um, sociology, um, and you know, even anthropology, if you wanted to get into it. Nutrition will also, and what we'll talk about in this course, will also include recommendations for what and how to eat in order to really provide health to the human body through food. And then nutrition can also look at aspects of food safety, food production, and food policy. So that will be that that starts to also kind of cross over into public health. Um, and I know a lot of you who take this course are also studying public health and community health. So there's a, a ton of overlap between nutrition and public and global health. Let's take a tiny, a tiny dip into the history of the science of nutrition. So really, I would say we kind of started not that long ago, right? We could kind of go back to the mid 1700s and say that it was around that time that researchers and scientists and medical professionals started to notice that there was an association between what people ate and certain illnesses. By the 1800s, we started to actually identify chemically these molecules that we call carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins. And we were also beginning to identify some minerals. Many minerals are also considered nutrients to the human body. Then by the early, tw early 20th century, so the 1900s, um, nutrition research really started to emerge, I would say, as a field. And we started to look at diseases that were really based strictly on deficiencies of certain nutrients. By um, kind of the end of World War II, nutrition research started to shift a little bit in, toward the direction of wellness. Um, at that time, still looking at treating different chronic diseases with nutrition. 
Um, and then today, like in the in the 2000s, kind of kind of the early 2000s, I guess still, um, nutrition research continues to include, you know, noticing when diseases are related to nutrient deficiencies, still treating chronic diseases with nutrition. Um, and just studying any of the, the more abundant diseases that we have um, and understanding the nutrition relationship to those diseases. So some of the leading diseases in the United States would be cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, and cancers. So that's, those are some of the major focal points of nutrition research um, in the, in the early-ish parts of the 21st century. So when we talk about nutrition related to wellness or nutrition related to health, how is it exactly that nutrition contributes to health? Well, uh, <laughs> that's kind of what we're gonna be learning about throughout the semester, um, but we can sort of summarize it briefly here. And we can say that nutrition really is an active process. So it's not like one and done, like, okay, I ate an apple last year, so I'm good. It's literally an ongoing process. Nutrition is about continually choosing healthful foods, putting them in your body by eating them, um, and simultaneously kind of reducing or limiting or even avoiding our exposure to or consumption of um, foods or food products that sort of cancel out nutrition. So wellness, we can say, is beyond just the absence of disease. It includes the absence of disease, meaning there is no disease state present. But nutrition and wellness also include consuming a healthful diet, or we could say a nutritious diet. And diet, let me point out right here, because um, I don't actually write this out in any of our slides, but the word diet has two meanings. Well, it kind of has one, but... Uh, we use it in two different ways. So we use the word diet, originally we used the word diet just to mean the different types of food that a, that a person eats, or we could say the different foods that um, like a, a certain culture of people eats, or the types of foods that a people in a certain region of the world eat. So diet literally just meant that, like what's your diet? What's their diet? What's his diet? You know, what's your neighbor's diet? Um, it just means what do they eat? What are the different types of foods that a person eats? This second definition that I'm referring to that's a little more recent is talking about um, calorie restriction, right? Or restricting a certain type of food. Like, oh, I, you know, all these fad diets. So uh, I follow the paleo diet or I follow the keto diet or I follow the low carb diet or I'm on a, I'm on a 1,000 calorie diet. That's a newer way of using the word diet that, that sort of subtly implies restriction. So I just want to say first, <laughs> right from go, I often use the word diet with its original definition, which just means the foods that a person eats, right? So just make note of that. When you hear me saying diet, more often than not, I'm just meaning, what do you eat? In certain contexts, I might use the word to mean restriction, but I'll, that should be pretty evident when I'm using it to mean restriction. Uh, so definitely email me if you have any questions on that, but I think this is really important to point out because your textbook will also use diet in the original sense of the word. So. Um, wellness includes following a nutritional diet. In other words, following a nutritious way of eating. So a nutritious diet or a nutritious way of eating is one that provides energy. So literally provides energy to the body and to the brain. Also supplies functional chemicals. So these are the things that we just listed back here, carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins as well as minerals and vitamins. These are chemicals that our bodies require in order to function. So that's why we call them functional chemicals that are utilized for mental and physical tasks. 
So again, brain and body. And then again, a nutritious diet also boosts our ability to fight infections. So when we eat a healthful, when we eat healthfully, we are supporting and improving our immune system. So a nutritious, a nutritious diet provides energy, um, supports our immune system, and provides these functional chemicals. Um, we're going to kind of refer refer back to this concept um, in a future slide. So two key components of wellness uh, include nutrition and physical activity. So nutrition kind of supports overall wellness, which again is this ongoing process of being free of disease and really actually thriving. So sometimes wellness and health are also used uh, synonymously, um, but I think wellness, again, beyond the absence of disease is really meaning thriving. Well, I'll write thrive here. Um, this is figure 1.1 from, from your textbook. So again, this just kind of goes over how nutrition supports wellness. So uh, supports our ability to perform basic tasks of daily living, right? Like walking to and from school or work, um, doing your school work or doing your job if you have a job. Um, nutrition supports our ability to concentrate and perform mental tasks. Again, it supports our immune system. Um, and it also provides opportunities for social interactions through shared cooking and eating experiences. So why is nutrition so important? <laughs> well, um, I, I hope the answers are obvious, or at least they'll become obvious throughout these next several weeks. Um, but we can again sort of summarize here and say that nutrition is important because it can prevent disease, it can reduce the risk for certain diseases. Um, nutrition is also important because it increases that sense of wellness or well-being, right? Which is, again, I would say synonymous with this concept of thriving. So um, I haven't fully introduced myself <laughs> to you all, but I have a second job which involves health and wellness coaching. Um, so I teach here at Corning Community College and I also work as a health and wellness coach. And in wellness, there is definitely this or I like to say to folks that um, health and wellness can kind of exist on a spectrum, right? Or health can exist on a spectrum. And at the far end, we have like wellness, which is thriving. And on the other end, we might have like really poor health disease, maybe multiple diseases, really poorly managed. So lots of aches and pains, really poorly functioning physical or mental capacities. So there's this long continuum of health from, you know, again, a very severe disease state or potentially multiple diseases going on at the same time, the opposite end of the spectrum being thriving, where wellness really takes place. So nutrition is really interesting because it's kind of a tool that can be applied anywhere throughout that spectrum, right? Because if we're in a really diseased state, we can use nutrition to help support that person and that, that body and that mind coming out of that diseased state. And then we can arrive like somewhere in the middle of this continuum if we wanted to and say, okay, I'm not thriving. I'm also not full of disease. I'm kind of here in this <laughs> middle where, you know, maybe some days I feel great and some days feel kind of like crap, right? So, there's like we might have pretty good nutrition at that point and there's still more we could do with nutrition to kind of bring ourselves into this state of thriving where every day we really feel pretty darn good so that's what i mean by this continuum right nutrition can be applied on the on the end of the continuum that is disease where we can kind of prevent or reduce the risk for disease or even um, improve a disease state and then nutrition can be applied all throughout that continuum to this other far end, which is where we're using nutrition optimally and engaging in physical activity on a routine basis. And a person really feels like they are thriving, like they're living their best life. So um, in that same vein, when we don't eat well, when we don't get enough exercise or a combination of those, that can again kind of lead us towards that other end of the continuum where we are 
pretty unhealthy um, and experiencing a lot of health complications like disease or again multiple disease states simultaneously. So what are some diseases, if we go, I'm just going to actually toggle all the way back to here, right, when we said in the mid 1700s, when kind of nutrition science maybe just got started, it started because we researchers were noticing um, an association between what people ate and different illnesses. So here is kind of an example of a disease that is a direct result of a nutrient deficiency. So a direct result of. Um, we'll talk about toxicity um, later on, but this one is representing a deficiency. So what's being shown here is a disease called ariboflavinosis, ariboflavinosis, which is a disease that comes from not getting enough of the vitamin riboflavin, which is vitamin B2. Um, and so one of the major symptoms of B2 deficiency is this chelosis that can occur on the lips and kind of right around the lips. So chelosis is basically having chapped and, ch chapped and cracked lips. Um, you know, sometimes we can get a little bit of chapping or cracked lips because maybe we had too much sun exposure or maybe it's super super dry but also being deficient in vitamin b2 can be a source of this um, issue so that's a direct relationship right not enough vitamin b2 you have this physical malady so again that's one of the maybe more obvious signs of nutrition how nutrition works in our bodies um, let me just toggle all the way back again. So one of the other things we said about nutrition um, as a science and its evolution, right? Um, we started to look at nutrition associated with chronic diseases. So here, uh, and again, this is figure 1.2 from chapter one. This is just showing different diseases that have a strong nutritional component meaning lack of nutrition, lack of healthy food intake seems to make these diseases worse to severely worse. Whereas in the same way, if we apply good nutrition, if we improve quality of food intake, if we improve food eating patterns, we can take these diseases from really, really, really poor states and move them along that continuum back to health and even move past just basic health and move towards thriving. So some of the diseases which are very common in the United States that have a strong relationship to nutrition include heart disease, uh, where am I? Let me actually go back to highlighter. So including heart disease, stroke, diabetes, um, as well as some diseases of the mind. So Alzheimer's disease, um, Parkinson's disease, not listed here, uh, chronic respiratory disease, and then influenza and pneumonia too. So focusing specifically on kind of the chronic diseases, we'd be looking at, again, stroke, uh, heart disease, cancer, um, diabetes, da, da, da. And even inflammatory diseases, honestly, uh, which is part of what Alzheimer's disease is too. So this chart is showing just, sorry, coming at this from another lens. This chart is actually showing us some of the leading causes of death in the United States. So heart disease and cancer are, are the leading causes of death in the United States. And they are diseases that have a strong relationship to nutrition. Not saying that nutrition would necessarily cure these diseases in every case um, or even in any case, but nutrition should absolutely be part of the treatment, part of the therapy for improving anyone, anyone's health who is experiencing heart disease or cancer. Same goes again for stroke, Alzheimer's disease, diabetes, inflammatory kidney disease, and other inflammatory diseases. So, um, yeah, so again, just kind of thinking on that continuum of health. If we're in these disease states, usually that's because 
well, multiple reasons could get us there, but one of those reasons is almost always lack of good nutrition. And if we wanna move from that diseased state back towards health on that continuum, nutrition is almost always going to need to be part of that equation of improving the healthfulness of that person. Um, nutrition also, hopefully, obviously, has an incredibly strong correlation with overweight and obesity. Uh, so these charts look at 1994 compared to 2010 and obesity rates across the United States. Um, you might know obesity rates have been pretty steadily increasing over the last 30, 40, 50 years, really. So if we look at 2010, which is obviously a, a little old, a little dated even now, um, we are showing almost no states that have a 15 to 20 percent obesity rate. We're showing a lot of states that have more than 35 percent obesity rate. We're showing a lot that have at least a quarter of the population experiencing obesity. So obesity, right, being overweight or being obese unto itself isn't per se a problem until it impacts a person's ability to carry on activities of daily living, like cleaning the house or you know, mowing the lard or lard, <laughs> mowing the lawn or doing yard work, um, going to the grocery store. Right? At that point, if obesity is impeding those activities, then or even being able to sleep well, right, then yes, obesity is causing problems to the healthfulness of that person. But beyond that, obesity is such a hot button item because of its ability to increase the risk for other diseases, especially cardiovascular disease. So just heart disease overall, potential for stroke, potential for heart attack, as well as diabetes. Um, we also know that, ob <laughs> that obesity um, increases the risk for metabolic syndrome, where we have we might have multiple underlying systems kind of malfunctioning at the same time. So again, obesity unto itself isn't necessarily a problem. It becomes problematic if it's impeding the activities of daily living and impeding other a person's other abilities to engage in healthful activities. Um, but really, obesity is becomes such an issue because it can lay can set the stage for many other diseases to occur much more easily and to be much more severe. Um, so this is another uh, example of nutrition having, I would say, a direct relationship to a disease, but it is not the only um, cause of the disease. So what's being shown here is osteoporosis, right, where we have pretty significant bone loss due to lack of vitamin D, calcium, those would be the two major ones. Um, so in this case, again, nutrition plays a role, um, although it's not the sole cause of the disease. So some other examples, again, cancer, nutrition plays a strong role, joint diseases like osteoarthritis, and then this disease, which is osteoporosis. Um, so having, a, again, a strong nutritional component. Alrighty, so again, all of this is kind of introductory pieces to nutrition. This part here, kind of these next several slides, um, introducing a lot of what we'll talk about in unit two, but, but there is some kind of uh, specific information for you to take away from just this lecture. So what we're kind of moving into here starting to move into, this is going to span the next like 30 slides, uh, are nutrition recommendations, right? So how do we come to understand, how do we come to understand nutrition and what we sh should be eating or what, you know, what we can eat to support health? So uh, we'll start here talking about some of the um, national guidelines and national recommendations that we have in the United States. So one of the nutrition related um, sort of public health programs that we have in the United States is something called Healthy People 2020. So this was a, uh, an initiative developed in 2020, which is basically 
an initiative to promote health throughout our nation. And part of health promotion involves disease prevention, so preventing diseases from happening. So Healthy People is something that will be revised every 10 years. So Healthy People 2020 will be updated in 2030. And um, it was developed largely by scientific and health experts who work at the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, of course, I'm sure they consulted experts who don't work specifically for the department, right? Um, so the, the Department of Health and Human Services kind of collected information from various experts in science and medicine and health and wellness and put together um, sort of this plan to promote health and prevent disease for citizens of the United States. So there are, um, in this plan, in this initiative, these experts identified basically five categories that influence our health. So those five categories are biology and genetics, our behavior, social factors, health services, right, like access to health services and what types of services are available, as well as policy. So these are five, ca five broad categories that influence health of the people in the United States. Um, Interestingly, maybe, but not surprisingly, nutrition and physical activity are influenced by each of these five categories. So biology and genetics influence food choice, food behavior, physical activity. Behavior obviously relates directly to what we choose to eat, how we choose to be active. Social influences, right? So um, whether that's um, kind of the neighborhood or the part of the city or the part of the town where a person lives, kind of social environmental factors, um, whether that's also cultural factors, right? So how we have lots of different cultures that, that live in the United States. So different cultural preferences or cultural practices. Again, health services are gonna influence um, knowledge, perhaps an understanding of nutrition and physical activity, and also policy making. It's kind of that, um, that really subliminal influence on all of us that kind of governs, again, both access to safe spaces to be physically active, ac access to healthy food choices, um, cost of um, accessing some of these services. So this is, this is one area where nutrition really starts to blend into public health and vice versa, right? Um, anyone who is working in the realm of public and community health has a um, perhaps a duty to uh, understand nutrition and understand all these different influences on a person's ability to and willingness to engage in healthful activities and healthful food choices. So some other um, components of Healthy People 2020. So things that influence our health include both well, personal, social, economic, and envir environmental factors. So again, these determinants might fit into these five categories that we listed here. Um, and again, we have the five broad categories that, that influence health. Oh, this is a repeat. I'm sorry, I didn't realize <laughs> that this slide basically says what this slide says. Okay, so that's a duplicate. Alrighty, so then, Right, we said Healthy People 2020 is basically a, a health promotion disease prevention plan. So in this plan, the, our health experts and government um, officials from the Department of Health and Human Services identified four goals, again, looking at a span of 2020 to 2030, so a 10-year span. So one of the goals is to help people attain higher quality and longer lives, to help people be free of preventable diseases, free of disability, injury, and preventive death, preventative death, a death that, that could have been prevented. A secondary goal is to achieve health equity. So, so again, equal access to healthcare, equal um, healthcare provisions for all people, um, thereby eliminating health disparities and improving health for people overall. Third would be to create environments, both physical environments and social environments that promote good health. So again, a physical environment might be just a safe space to be physically active. A social environment might be um, you know, access to grocery stores that are selling fresh local produce. 
right? Uh, or selling other healthy foods. And then the fourth, um, or social might also just be safe spaces to get together with people um, in, a, in a healthful context. Um, the fourth would be promoting quality of life, healthy development, and healthy behaviors across all life stages. So again, lots of overlap in these goals, but you can kind of see they're each a little bit distinct, and they each basically have a nutrition and physical activity um, component. So this slide, does it go on? This slide is kind of uh, for your own information. Um, these are some of the goals written out in more detail for Healthy People 2020. Um, weight status, food and nutrient composition, and physical activity. I'm not going to test you on the specifics. I'm not going to test you on the specifics of Healthy People 2020 or the goals. Um, basically, I just want you to understand what Healthy People 2020 is, that it is this national plan to promote health and to prevent disease. So again, it's, it's uh, nutrition is with us always and everywhere. Um, nutrition is with us always because we are continually making choices to either engage in healthful food consumption or to not, right? Um, but nutrition is also always with us because, again, there are kind of these more subliminal powers, which include our federal government and state governments and local governments um, that are continually sort of making policies and making plans to sort of organize our external environment to influence us, hopefully, right, ideally with something like this, to influence us towards making healthier choices. Alrighty, so <laughs> Healthy People 2020, we're gonna visit kind of a parallel concept in a few slides. Before we get there, I wanna introduce this concept of nutrients. So, so let's take the definition that's written here. So nutrients by definition are, we might insert here functional chemicals that are found in our food that are critical for growth and function. So you might remember on an earlier slide we learned of, or we, we introduced this concept of functional chemicals. Sorry, I'm writing with my mouse, which is not the easiest thing. Right. So functional chemicals found in food that are critical for growth and function. Um, I guess I won't toggle back to the previous slide because that was a little ways away. So nutrients we can subdivide into two categories. Actually, we can subdivide them multiple ways. Right here, I just want to point out that we can have organic nutrients and we can have inorganic nutrients. This is kind of a more chemical definition, organic and inorganic. At the end of this semester, we're going to learn about organic as it relates to agriculture and farming and growing food. But right now, we're talking like, insert your brain into your high school chemistry lab, we're talking about organic and inorganic at a chemical level, so at a molecular level. So organic nutrients are nutrients that contain carbon and hydrogen. So cement that into your understanding. Um, that will definitely be a test question. Organic just means it contains carbon. Um, organic nutrients are also essential components of all living organisms. So this is another, um, sometimes this is also used as a definition of organic, but if it's organic, it's living, right? So anything that we say is alive contains carbon. So in nutrition, because there are lots of organic nutrients that we won't really talk about in this class, because remember that's kind of a chemical concept and we're, we're just gonna talk about some aspects of chemistry in this class, not all of them. So organic nutrients that our bodies um, are made up of and utilize include carbohydrates, lipids, lipids and fats we'll talk about, proteins and vitamins. So do, actually I could probably change that. So carbohydrates, lipids, proteins and vitamins, remember that. 
Inorganic, on the other hand, refers to nutrients that do not contain carbon. Pretty simple. Organic, it contains carbon. It's a component of all living things. Inorganic, no carbon. And another thing that hopefully will become a little more obvious when we talk, when we get into unit two, is that usually wherever there's carbon, there is hydrogen. So I'm just going to emphasize the carbon piece here, but usually if carbon is present, hydrogen is also present. So examples of inorganic nutrients that we're going to talk about in this class include minerals and water. So um, let's just give a quick example here. If you think about um, what, what would be a mineral, so take a second and think of a mineral that you're familiar with. And again, <laughs> plop yourself back in your high school chemistry lab. Imagine that periodic table of elements. Those are all elements. Many of them are minerals. What would be one example? Right. Maybe like calcium. Maybe you're thinking like iron. Maybe you're thinking magnesium. Maybe you're thinking potassium, sodium, right? These are all minerals. Remember, carbon is carbon, also on the periodic table of elements, and hydrogen is hydrogen. So pretty straightforwardly, if you look at calcium, iron, magnesium, cal potassium, sodium, they don't have, they don't contain carbon. They just are calcium, or iron, or magnesium, or potassium, or sodium. These are things that just can't be simplified any further, right? Minerals are minerals. They're already at their most basic form. So it's either calcium or it's carbon. <laughs> it's either potassium or it's sodium. So minerals don't contain carbon and hydrogen, unless they are carbon or hydrogen. But minerals don't contain carbon and hydrogen. Also, what is water? Can you think of that molecular formula for water? It's pretty straightforward, right? It's H2O. So what is this? This is hydrogen. Yes, this is hydrogen. And this is oxygen, right? There's no carbon. So that's why I say really focus on the carbon component because obviously water has hydrogen, but it doesn't have carbon and hydrogen. Whereas these ones listed up here, carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and vitamins, these are all what we would call molecules, meaning they are larger chemicals or molecules that are made up of many different elements, right? So carbohydrates are made up of carbon and hydrogen and oxygen. Interestingly, so are lipids, so are proteins, and so are vitamins. So carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and vitamins are larger, more complex molecules that are made up of different elements. OK. Um, this is an important slide. Also. As with any chapter, definitely read the chapter that corresponds to this lecture, so chapter one. Um, read the chapter in your textbook because the textbook will probably help solidify a lot of this understanding. Okay, so let me go back here. Okay, so we said we have so we said nutrients are the functional chemicals that we find in food that are critical for growth and functioning. We have inorganic and organic nutrients. Alrighty, here we're going to talk about the six classifications. So I say groups, but I might also say, and I'm just going to write with my finger because sometimes that is faster. Classifications of, nutri of nutrients. Yeah. So there are six. So do remember these six. I'm going to come back down here and go to my highlighter. So we have Carbohydrates, and we actually listed all six on the previous slide. We have carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, vitamins, and we have minerals and water. Remember, we just said these two are inorganic, minerals and water, and we just said that these uh, top ones are organic, carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and vitamins. Another little subdivision we can make is noticing these three that are in bold. So carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins. 
These are our macronutrients. Macronutrients. And these two vitamins and minerals are our micro, micro nutrients. And then water, I, I don't include water as a macro or micronutrient, I kind of leave it as a standalone. So right here you can see there's a few different ways that we can organize this concept of nutrients. We can organize them by organic and inorganic, and then we can organize them by macronutrients and micronutrients. So this is also a really important slide. This will definitely be part of the unit one exam um, and will probably make its way into the final exam too. Um, all right, so figure 1.3 in your book, this is just looking at these six different categories uh, or classifications of our nutrients. So <laughs> this right here is kind of a summary Prepare, wrap your heads around this. This is a summary of unit two and unit three. What you see right here on this page. We're gonna talk about carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, vitamins, minerals, and water in so much detail that it's gonna get us all the way through unit two and all the way through unit three. So let's just highlight a few kind of quick, actually, you know what? Use this one as a summary for yourself. We're already going to go through each of these in more detail right here. So just kind of an introduction to these nutrients. Um, all right, so let's start with the macronutrients. So macronutrients, how can we, let me go back here. What can we say about carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins? Like why are they in this one group called macronutrients? Why do they get lumped together? Right? And why, you know, they're all organic, we can say that. But why then isn't mineral, you know, why isn't vitamin part of that group? Okay. So what makes macronutrients macronutrients? So this is also a really important slide. I love to ask this question. What makes macronutrient a macronutrient? And what makes micronutrients micronutrients? So again, please take note. Macronutrients are macro. Also think of what macro means in relation to micro. Macro and micro, right? You probably took macroeconomics and microeconomics, or maybe you didn't, but maybe your high school offered them, or maybe um, maybe you've thought about taking them before. So macro and micro. Macro meaning larger, micro meaning smaller. So we can say that macronutrients are required by the body in relatively large amounts. I also like to say macronutrients are also larger molecules than micronutrients. Um, okay, so larger, that's one piece. Let me alternate between, well, that's one piece. I'll circle back to those in a sec. So macronutrients are required in larger amounts to support the normal function and health of the body. Macronutrients also are a source of energy or fuel to our bodies, and we call that energy calories. We're going to talk more about that in a minute. Um, and the three examples are carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins. So I guess the three things I want you to remember is that they are required in large amounts. They supply energy or fuel. And then the third thing is that I want you to remember that they are just larger molecules. Sorry, it's kind of hard. <laughs> Larger molecules. I guess I could try to erase this. So I can fit my finger there. Larger molecules, right? Those are the three things I want you to remember about macronutrients. Now, if we come down here and see um, alcohols written here, Right? So alcohol, we could call it a macro molecule, but what we aren't going to call it is a macro nutrient. Right? So alcohol is a larger molecule, but it is not a nutrient. Why is it not a nutrient? Let's think back to what a nutrient is. 
what's the definition of a nutrient? It's something that's critical for growth and function. Is alcohol critical for growth and function? I'm sure we can make lots of jokes about alcohol, right? And if, if you like drinking a beer or a glass of wine or something or a mixed drink, but let's face the facts, is alcohol critical for growth and function? Absolutely not, right? And in case, in fact, it even impedes growth and function. So alcohol can be considered both, is considered, not can be, is considered both a drug and a toxin to the human body. Alcohol absolutely does not support regulation of body functions, nor does it support building or repairing body tissue. So we have alcohol written here because it is macro in that it is large relative to say water or a mineral, but it is not a macro nutrient. So let me actually circle a fourth point up here, which is this. I do, you do need to know for this class and hopefully for your own understanding as a person who engages in nutrition throughout the rest of your lifetime, that there are three molecules that are considered macronutrients. And those three molecules are carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins. All right. Doesn't look like there's a lot on this slide, but there's a lot on this slide. Okay, so I said we'd circle back to this concept of a calorie. What is a calorie? How is a calorie? <laughs> That's funny. Uh, you know what, let's just edit that right now. I think I can do this without losing. Uh, whatever. Okay, so let's just say what is a calorie? Okay, so what is a calorie? <laughs> calorie is a unit of measurement. It's a measurement of energy in food. Measurement of energy in food. So energy in food is measured in kilocalories, abbreviated KCAL. And you know, if, you're, if you're really being specific, we're gonna, you would use the concept kilocalorie in place of calorie, but calorie is sort of the colloquial way that we say in the United States that we say calorie or kilocalorie, excuse me. So in our class, I'm, I and we will use kilocalorie and calorie interchangeably. And your book does this largely too. Um, now, obviously, if you are familiar with the metric system, right, like a meter relative to a kilometer, there's a difference that differs by a thousand, right? In this case, let's kind of scrap that concept from your brain, although it's, you know, yes, you understand the metric system if you understand that, but scrap that concept from your brain. We're just going to say that a calorie is synonymous with a kilocalorie. And largely that's just because saying calorie is shorter than saying kilocalorie. So sometimes you'll see the, the, this abbreviation KCAL. KCAL refers to calorie. So the formal definition of a kilocalorie is right here. One kilocalorie is equivalent to or equals the amount of heat that's required to raise the temperature of one kilogram of water by one degree Celsius. So again, it's a measurement of energy, right? It's the, the measurement of energy in the form of heat that's required to raise the temperature of one kilogram of water by one degree Celsius. So we have calorie written here, and we're talking about calories right now, because we just said that macronutrients provide calories. Macronutrients provide calories. What are the three nutrients that are macronutrients? Carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins. So carbohydrates provide calories, lipids provide calories, and proteins provide calories. They provide different amounts of calories based on the amount of water in them, right? Or based on the amount of water that uh, could be in them, if you will. Because one thing we haven't totally said yet is that, well, I did say this, but I'm gonna write it out. Carbohydrates, proteins, and lipids, they're all made up of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. And what is water? Water is two hydrogens and an oxygen. 
So if in a carbohydrate, a protein, and a lipid, you have carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, you can technically make water from any of those nutrients. So depending on the amount of hydrogen and oxygen in a carbohydrate, a protein, or a lipid, or I should say the amount of hydrogen and oxygen in a carb carbohydrate, protein, and lipid influences the amount of calories that molecule contains because calorie is directly referring to the heat required to raise the temperature of, of water basically by one degree Celsius. So um, basically just this kind of becomes rote memorization right here. We're gonna talk about these concepts in a little more detail as we get into carbohydrates, as we get into unit two and talk about the macronutrients in more detail. Um, but I think this is the only slide I have where this is written, and this is also really important for you to know. So again, kind of just becomes memorization. One gram of carbohydrate provides four calories. One gram of protein also provides four calories, so that's easy, that's the same. One gram of lipid, though, provides nine calories. We're going to talk about this concept of energy density, I think actually in chapter two, but the point here is that Quick math would show you, right? One gram of a lipid provides twice the amount of calories as a carbohydrate or a protein. So in the same, in the same amount, one gram, you have more than twice the number of calories. So that's a more dense molecule. There's more density to a lipid. There's more energy density to a lipid, which is to say there's more calorie density to a lipid. Again, we'll come back to this concept in more detail, um, but start to try to make sense of this or read this section in your textbook, because again, uh, hopefully that'll help, reading it will help it all make more sense to you. And then one gram of alcohol, again, not a macronutrient, but a macromolecule, and still a calorie providing molecule. One gram of alcohol provides seven calories. And so again, alcohol is energy dense. It's dense in the amount of calories it has. In other words, we don't need a lot of alcohol by mass in order to consume a lot of calories. Okay. All righty, now let's go through the macronutrients. Um, again, really just brief introduction. We have entire chapters devoted to these macronutrients in unit two. Carbohydrate, what can we say about carbohydrate? It is the primary fuel source for the body. When we say fuel, what are we going to be referring to? For our class, let's say that fuel is synonymous with calories, right? So calories, another thing it could be synonymous with actually, energy, right? So keep that in mind. If we say fuel, we are in, in the same way, we're saying calorie, we're saying energy. So carbohydrates are a primary source of energy, calories, fuel for the body, especially for the brain, and especially during physical exercise. Carbohydrates are composed of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. This is the, this is the chemical formula or the molecular formula for one of our most basic carbohydrates, which is glucose, which yes, is sugar. Um, I should also change that, but it's C6H12O6, right? You know what? Ah, sorry, I might be doing a lot of this. <laughs> um, uh, subscript. Okay, so C6H12O6, PowerPoint mode. Um, where do we find carbohydrates in our food? We find them in grains, such as wheat, rice, oats, corn, technically a grain. We find carbohydrates in vegetables, fruits, legumes, like beans, uh, like, like a chickpea or a black bean or a kidney bean, that kind of bean. Um, as well as peas, like just your green peas, as well as lentils. We also find carbohydrates in seeds, nuts, and milk. 
So you'll notice we're going to talk a lot about plant and animal foods throughout this course. These are all, I should have underlined products, but these are all plants, right? So all basically all plant food is a source of carbohydrate. The only animal-based food that provides carbohydrate is milk or milk products like yogurt or cheese. Fiber, we're going to talk a lot about fiber. Fiber is a type of carbohydrate. How about lipids? So lipids are a diverse group of organic substances that are insoluble in water, meaning they won't bind with water. Think of making salad dressing. You take oil and vinegar. Vinegar is very water-based. Oil is lipid. You really have to force them to try to mix together. Otherwise, if they settle out, they'll separate because lipids and water don't mix. Lipids are also composed of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Um, three of the categories of lipids that we'll talk about include triglycerides, phospholipids, and sterols. So triglyceride is the most common lipid that we find in both our food and our body. That should say and body. Um, <laughs> triglycerides are also a main source of energy, specifically though during rest or low to moderate intensity exercise. Triglycerides are also the form of lipid that we store on our bodies as adipose tissue. So anywhere we have body fat, right? Most of, most of us have a you know, some degree of body fat um, subcutaneous, so like beneath the skin, and that can be in, that throughout the body. We have tiny bits of fat that line our, uh, um, uh, the organs in our abdomen as kind of a protective um, barrier. And then in anywhere where we might have what we might call excess fat, whether that's kind of in the hips or the buttocks or sometimes on the back or the arms, that's all adipose tissue. And it's basically, it's a tissue that's made up of these triglyceride molecules. We'll learn about phospholip, we'll learn about all of these again in much more detail, but phospholipids and sterols aren't energy storage. Triglycerides are energy storage. Phospholipids and sterols are much more functional. They do things like maintain the integrity of a cell wall or facilitate um, fat digestion, lipid digestion, or facilitate nutrient transportation in the blood. So phospholipids and sterols much more, they have more function per se. Triglycerides are more of an energy source. Um, and then triglycerides, are also um, involved in how we um, absorb and utilize our fat-soluble vitamins. Proteins, so again, protein being the third of our macronutrient. Um, let's see, proteins are important for building tissue, so building new cells, building new tissue. So that can be like after a really intense exercise, you've kind of broken down some of your muscle tissue, you need to rebuild. That's part of protein is required to actually to protein is the new cellular matter, the new tissue matter. Um, same way if you had an injury, right? Whether, you know, kind of an internal or an external injury to some tissue, whether it's your skin uh, or again, maybe a muscle tissue or organ tissue, as your body recovers and repairs, it needs protein to do that repair to make new cell and new tissue. Protein is involved in maintaining bone health, again, repairing damage to cellular tissue, and proteins also play a major role in regulating metabolism and fluid balance. So many of our hormones um, are protein-based hormones. Some are sterile-based hormones, but some are protein-based. Really important here, while proteins are a macronutrient and therefore do provide calories, Proteins are not a primary source of calories, and therefore not a primary source of energy. Proteins really are important for these reasons that we just listed, structure and function. We're gonna talk about amino acids a little bit because amino acids are the building blocks of proteins. We of these four elements, yeah. <laughs> um, your book goes over the four elements that amino acids are made of, very similar to your DNA. I don't need you to know that for this um, course, but if you want to take a look at those four elements, again, we'll, we'll revisit that 
uh, in chapter six, I think, is when we talk about protein specifically. Um, and then another important piece about proteins, so, well, sorry, let me just say, for amino acids, I just want you to recognize that we call them the building blocks of the protein. So amino acids join to one another, and once we get this, these huge chains of amino acids, usually we'll put two of those chains together, we'll kind of, our bodies will kind of morph them into different shapes, and that's when we then have a functional protein. So proteins are very, very large, complex molecules. Part of their um, structure involves, again, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, and also nitrogen. So this is a really important um, nuance of proteins is that they have nitrogen, and the nitrogen is found in the amino acids. Uh, interestingly, on this slide, we didn't say what foods we find lipids in. We find lipids actually in almost every food that we eat. Um, many of our plant foods provide some amount of lipid. Some are fattier than others, like um, nuts and seeds tend to be fattier sources, uh, richer in lipids. Um, usually we say fat when we, we refer to lipid in food, and usually we say lipid when we refer to these molecules as they exist in our bodies. Um, obviously, animal foods can be a, a great source of fat. Um, again, whether it's the meat or it's the milk or it's the eggs, uh, <laughs> all of those contain fat. Um, and then nuts and seeds and some types of fruit, right? Like the avocado is a fattier fruit. But again, well, just about everything we eat provides some amount of lipid or fat. So protein, maybe not surprisingly, protein is also something we find in just about every food that we eat, found in many foods, both plant and animal. Um, I think everybody's familiar with meat being a source of protein. Dairy can be a source of protein. So again, milk and milk products. And then seeds, nuts, and legumes are also great sources of protein. Um, whole grains, especially if they are whole, uh, and many of our vegetables also provide protein. All right, so then the micronutrients. Now, I don't have a standalone slide for micronutrients, so let me write a few things here. Right? What makes micronutrients, gosh, I don't know what it is that I do that makes it make that little jab, but what is it that makes micronutrients like, why do we categorize them as micronutrients? And see if you can actually remember what are the two types of nutrients that we categorize as micronutrients. One of them is written here, vitamin. What was the other one that we also categorize as micronutrient? So vitamins and minerals, right? What makes them mi micro, one is that they're smaller. So again, micro and macro. So smaller meaning two things, smaller in size and smaller meaning the amount required by the body. So just like we said with macronutrients. So smaller in size and smaller in the amount required in the body. Um, is there anything else I want you to say or remember with micronutrients? Um, Let's also say as a third thing that micronutrients support the overall function of the body. Sorry, that says function, right? Micronutrients support the overall function of the human body. So micronutrients do not supply or provide calories. They really support the overall functioning of the body. And in some cases, I should say structure. So if you think back structure, if you think back to a riboflavonosis on that first slide, um, that's partly structure of the lips, right? That chelosis that was happening from vitamin B2 deficiency, not having enough vitamin B2 means that we're not actually having healthy structure of the cells around our lips. Um, and then, you know, structure and function, think about again the vitamin, the vitamin D and the calcium that support our bones. When we looked at that slide of osteoporosis, vitamin D is a vitamin, calcium is a mineral. So they support collectively also with vitamin K and phosphorus, support 
how the bones um, take shape, so structure, but bones are also very active organs. So they, they actually provide a lot of functionality to the body, both in terms of like being a skeleton and allowing us to move, but also in actually maintaining calcium status throughout the body. So we'll talk more about that. So those are the three things I want you to remember. Well, one, I guess, is here, two is here, and three is here for what um, micronutrients are. So sorry, that's a little condensed. All right, so then this slide is just talking about vitamins. Maybe I'll change the color there. All right, so this slide, we're just talking about vitamins. So vitamins are organic. Remember we said minerals are inorganic, but vitamins are organic. And that just means that they contain carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Um, so what are the different ways that vitamins support structure and function? Just some examples. Again, we're gonna spend multiple chapters learning about all the different vitamins and their different functions and, um, and, and their different functions in the body. So some vitamins support energy metabolism, meaning how we break down macronutrients and release the energy that they, that they carry. Um, vitamins also support, again, healthy maintenance of bone and tissue. Again, bone and tissue. Um, vitamins also support our immune system. They support our vision, like how our eyes work. Again, they do not contain or supply energy. Okay, now here is a difference between vitamins and minerals. Let me put this differently. So this is a difference between vitamins and minerals. Vitamins, because they're organic and because they're molecules, and remember a molecule is a larger compound made up of different elements. So because vitamins are a molecule, they can be changed, right? It can be broken down. Whereas I said that a mineral is already exists, they already exist in their simplest form. They can't be broken down any further. So vitamins can be broken down, which means anything from light exposure to heat exposure to oxygen exposure can change the nature of the vitamin. Where do we find a lot of light, heat, and air with regard to vitamins? Cooking and preserving and processing of our foods, right? So as we prepare foods, we might lose some of the vitamin content of those foods. And certainly the more prepared or the more processed a food is, the more likely it is that that food has lost some of its vitamin content. We will also talk about two types of fats, uh, sorry, two types of vitamins, fat soluble and water soluble. And this is important because it affects both how we digest how we absorb, how we transport, how we utilize, and whether or not we can store these vitamins. Here is, um, again, this is all just an overview and introduction, but here is an example, a, a table that shows you the fat soluble and the water soluble vitamins. So the, the water soluble, I'm gonna start here because I think this is a little bit easier to remember. Water soluble include vitamin C, and then the whole class of B vitamins. That's it, but which is a lot, it's the majority, but all you really have to remember is B and C. Whereas fat soluble includes the other four, which is vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin E, and vitamin K. So fat soluble vitamins, one of the, one of the primary reasons that we divide these into these two groups is because fat soluble vitamins can be stored in our adipose tissue. And that means that we can actually reach levels of toxicity with these vitamins because we can wind up having excess amounts that can accumulate in the body. Whereas water soluble vitamins, we, they're, they're not fat soluble, so they can't be stored in the body. So they can't accumulate in various amounts. We excrete any excess in our urine. So it's generally, much harder to reach toxic levels um, with water-soluble vitamins. 
It is possible to do so, however, and really the only way that we can reach those toxic levels is if we're taking vitamins as supplements. What isn't totally written on this slide is that vitamins, hopefully this is a little bit obvious, but let me just say it in case not. All of these nutrients that we're talking about, remember, actually, let me just go back to nutrient, right? These are found in our foods, right? <laughs> so when we're talking about carbohydrates, fats, and proteins, I think this is a little more obvious because we talk about these more like in popular media, but also vitamins, minerals, and water are in our food. First and foremost, they're in our food. <laughs> so in modern times, we talk about vitamins and minerals as supplements also because now they are. They're these, they're these isolated products that you can buy. But first and foremost, vitamins and minerals occur in our foods. So when we come back here and I say that it's generally only the case that we can achieve tox toxic levels of vitamin C or vitamin B, what I mean is you, it would be next to impossible to eat so many oranges or bell peppers or broccoli that you, that you achieved toxic levels of vitamin C. But if you take vitamin C as a capsule, as a supplement, it can be much easier to achieve toxic levels because you can take so much so quickly. Okay. All right. And then minerals. Remember, minerals are micronutrients. So refer back here and review these, oops, these three things. Micronutrients. They're smaller in size. They're smaller in the amount required in the body. And they um, support structure and function in the body. So minerals, remember, also are inorganic. Remember, that means they already exist in their simplest form. They don't contain carbon and hydrogen. So they can't be broken down any further. Therefore, they can't be destroyed by heat and light. So what this means is where cooking and preserving might destroy or reduce the amount of vitamin in a food, cooking or processing won't really change the amount of mineral in a food. So again, that is a difference from vitamin. Okay, other just things to highlight or point out about minerals. So minerals support um, fluid balance in the body, fluid and electrolyte balance. Minerals support energy production, just like vitamins support energy metabolism. Minerals support how, I guess we could say minerals also support energy metabolism. Um, specifically though, how we harness the energy from those macronutrients. They don't provide the energy, but they support how we get the energy from the macronutrients. Minerals also support bone and blood health. Um, and minerals are really important. They really support your liver is the organ that does this removal of harmful metabolic byproducts. So these byproducts are often just coming from general metabolism, right? As we digest our food, we're forming some not so productive byproducts like protein actually is a classic example. There's a byproduct of protein metabolism that is potentially harmful to our bodies if we have too much of it at once. So the liver in with the assistance of many different minerals helps to break down those byproducts and get them out of the body. Um, minerals can also be divided into two categories, major and trace. And this also just refers to the um, amount that we require. So major minerals, again, if you think of major and trace, like if you have a, a major amount of something or a trace amount of something, a major mineral is something that we require um, in larger amounts, so more than 100 milligrams per day. And a trace mineral is something that we require in smaller amounts, so less than 100 mg per day. Um, I'm not going to expect you to remember which minerals are major and which minerals are trace, but it may, it may become a little obvious as we talk more about minerals, because you'll see that calcium, phosphorus, sodium, potassium, chloride, magnesium, and sulfur have really critical functions to sort of the everyday processes of the body. Whereas iron, zinc, copper, manganese, fluoride, chromium, molybdenum, selenium, and iodine definitely support everyday processes of the body, um, 
but they're kind of more organ specific, if you, if you will. Whereas these major minerals are sort of throughout the body. So just a little tidbit. Alrighty, and then water, the last, so this says macronutrient. I don't really care how you want to classify it, macro or micro. Water is the sixth of our nutrients, right? So if we say there are six nutrients, it's carbohydrate, fat, protein, vitamin, mineral, water. So water again is inorganic because it doesn't contain carbon and it supports all body processes. So just like our major minerals, water is kind of major in that it's required throughout the body. So water supports things like fluid balance, our nerve impulse transmissions, body temperature regulation, muscle contraction, transporting nutrients, digestion of nutrients, excretion of waste products like your urine, your feces, and sweat. Water we can get from, from drinking water, but we also do get water from our food, as is implied by the definition of nutrient. So certainly more liquid-based foods, like anything that's brothy, like a soup or a stew, is going to provide water. Tea is going to provide water, um, especially if it's not sweetened. <laughs> um, and also electrolyte beverages, like something like something like a Gatorade, but not Gatorade, because Gatorade is sweetened. So unsweetened electrolyte beverages. Um, and then other foods that are kind of noticeably water rich. So think of think of biting into an apple or a summer peach, right? You bite into it and the lip, you know, the juices just kind of drip down your chin. That's because they're so watery, right? Or watermelon, maybe it's the obvious example. Um, and even something like a cucumber, really water rich, celery, um, tomato, right? Really water rich. So again, we can get water by drinking it. We also get water from our food. Um, okay, so I think this is where I want to pause for the end for the first part of chapter one. Let's see. Yep. So I'm going to pause here and just stop the recording so it's not so excessively long. Um, there will be part two to chapter one, so just watch that. You know, maybe take a 15 minute break if you have the time and then come back and start part two. Alrighty. Thanks all for listening. Uh, I'll stop the recording here. See you next